um, migration um, history seminar um, series. Um, and I'm very happy um, to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Renshaw from um, the University of Reading, who's um, published lots recently on um, various aspects, especially of um, discrimination, racism against all sorts of um, uh, ethnic minority and migrant groups uh, in Britain. And today, and one of his, and he's published in, you know, in a, in a really wide range of journals um, and his latest book, I believe, unless he's published another one since, is that this course of repatriation in Britain, 1815, 1845 to 2016, a political and social history. Um, and so he's here to um, talk to us, I guess, about a, a theme that evolves from, from that, from that poll. So I'll hand over uh, to Daniel. Well, thanks. Uh, first of all, can everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, just to double check. Yes. Good. Good stuff. Well, thanks for inviting me to come speak at the last um, one of the series of lectures. Um, and in today's uh, talk, I'm going to be examining different strands of the discourse surrounding removal in modern Britain. And I'm using removal in really the broadest sense to encompass expulsion, deportation, uh, repatriation, both voluntary and compulsory in the considerable grey area between the two, and relocation from uh, uh, to another um, part of the world. But really thinking of um, instances where it's either demanded or enacted that people are transported from this country to another territory. Um, I'm looking at it over quite a long chronological period. And just to say right at the start, I'm going to be jumping back and forth a bit between different uh, periods. In particular, um, uh, eras characterized by a so-called hostile environment. That term is obviously coined uh, in the late 1990s. But I'm using it retrospectively to describe periods where both the state and polemic displays uh, these uh, anti-migrant characteristics, um, including the wish to remove people either as individuals or as communities from the country. So on the morning of the 24th of June, 2016, social media users took to Twitter and other online platforms to celebrate or bewail the results of the referendum on continued membership of the European Union. On Twitter, some of those supporting the vote for leave suggested that as a result of this decision, certain parts of British society would now be required to leave the United Kingdom, perhaps imminently. This sentiment continued to be expressed outside of the virtual plane in the days following the vote, whereas I'm sure we're all aware there was a significant spike in instances of ethnic and religiously motivated violence and there were numerous cases of people being approached in supermarkets on buses in the street and told uh, 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 that in physically and uh, discursively threatening terms that their presence was no longer required in the country although a removal of migrants or those from minority communities played no part in the official leave campaigns in the build-up to the vote, it was clear following the 24th of June 2016 that for a very vocal and bellicose minority this was a part of, perhaps the main constituent part of, um, the promised Freedom Day that would follow the vote. And almost exactly four years later after that, following the consignment of Edward Colson, or rather um, his uh, representation to Bristol Harbour, once again, the removal of so-called ungrateful sections of British society was discussed loudly on uh, these social media platforms. So the term repatriation specifically enjoyed a particular vogue in the 1970s. Oh, I've got a question, I think. Sorry, hold on a second. Okay, 
That might have been a mistake. Um, should we leave the questions to the end, maybe? Um, I don't. I, I, I don't mind Panagos or whatever. I can't. I can't. I can't see a question. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we're having the questions at the end. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> just, sorry. Just, just sorry. Hand raised. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, so the term repatriation specifically enjoyed a particular vogue in the 1970s when through the efforts of Enoch Powell and various anti-migrant groups across the political spectrum, it became a positive solution uh, for the various ills thought to be affecting the sick man of Europe as Britain was described at the time. And as we may have a chance to talk about a bit later, both the term repatriation and the term immigrant in the 1970s, in the way that they used in a lot of this rhetoric, actually become separated from uh, their actual meanings. Uh, and although this discourse fades somewhat from the mainstream after Thatcher's victory in 1979, um, the responses to these recent events that I just outlined indicate that this attraction of uh, removal either of individuals or communities defined as in some way outside of the national collectivity retains its potency and going back to the mid 19th century uh, uh, mass removal of irish communities from glasgow from liverpool bristol london the northern mill towns in the 1840s 1850s and on into the into the mid-victorian period it's frequently presented as the most effective solution to a posited financial and social burden seen as unsustainable and in fact getting worse. So physically expelling those that you feel do not belong to or are harmful to the wider society is unsurprisingly appealing and on occasion this transcends the rhetorical and is taken up as policy by the state. In the modern period, government instigated mass removal, in other words, taking place on a very large scale based on ethnic identity, has only taken place in the very specific circumstances of wartime or a period immediately following the conclusion of a war. But nonetheless, during peacetime, both conservative and progressive administrations have created hostile environments, as I already referred to, which not only attempt to make it as difficult as possible to actually get into the United Kingdom, but also enable the removal of people already settled in the country. And during this time, as we'll discuss, the discourse on the efficacy of repatriation uh, and deportation, it can move from the extremities of the debate on immigration and identity and take root in governmental institutions, in particular in the modern period, in the Home Office. And perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about this at the end, thinking about what's going on at the moment. So the language of removal can appear to be brutally simple, that the targeted individual or group should simply go home. This slogan you see shouted, typed, daubed on walls and sometimes this discourse particularly when far right and it becomes associated in particular with radical right organizations can be reduced to this uh, demand however when we look at this in more detail it's clear that there are the presence of several interweaved strands that we can see have been historically present when repatriation as an idea or a policy is being discussed. And in this afternoon's lecture, I will discuss three of these strands, how they relate to each other, how they combine with each other, and the emphasis placed on these different elements of discourse in different contexts and at different times. So these strands, broadly speaking, are the practical, the humanitarian and what can be described described as the existential and this existential language as we'll examine uh, can lead to uh, uh, exterminatory language imagery or demands i.e that removal will be enforced through 
the threat of physical violence and possibly even of death. The first strand, the practical, focuses on the ways in which removal can reduce a financial or infrastructural burden, apparently rate related to immigration, or to tackle various forms of codified transgressive behavior. And this practical discourse on removal is the most apparent form of language when it's adopted by the institutions of the state and those bodies actually tasked with carrying out removal as government policy, such as the judiciary, the civil service and the police. As we'll discuss, this resolute practicality, especially when in the context of a hostile environment, uh, can be merely a veneer and home secretaries in their rhetoric often combine the practical with the existential. Examples of the practical elements of removal discourse can be found in the implementation of the 1905 Aliens Act, uh, where expulsion was uh, uh, framed as a punishment for migrants committing one of a number of codified and defined crimes or transgressions. Or indeed in the 1970s, when the British Civil Service in Whitehall discussed removal based on the failure of new Commonwealth migrants to secure employment after a set amount of time, or to be more exact, um, after having claimed unemployment benefit for a certain duration. The second strand of discourse, which can be described as humanitarian, is characterized by some concern being expressed, whether genuine or not, about the situation facing a particular migrant group in Britain and a belief that life would be better uh, in some way either in a homeland or in a third country of destination, uh, another country of destination rather than in Britain itself. And sometimes in humanitarian uh, removal discourse it's also emphasized that assistance should be offered to allow an individual or community to leave and occasionally you get a pattern of self-determination as well that a migrant or minority group should be encouraged to move en masse to another part of the world where they will have a better chance of establishing a prosperous and peace and peaceful uh, life for themselves and the humanitarian strand can be combined with the practical and the existential not only by organizations we could broadly define as progressive and what you could call the liberal left but also on political right as well and interestingly to make things a little more complicated it also forms a part of removal discourse as articulated by uh, minority communal bodies or political organizations uh, originating from minority communities so just to give two examples briefly, in the 1900s, you have Anglo-Jewish charities across the country, most notably the Board of Guardians in London, uh, which uh, on a significant scale undertake to facilitate the removal of Jewish refugees uh, uh, who have arrived from the Pale of Settlement and Romania, either back to Eastern Europe or onwards to the United States of America. Um, uh, uh, and has, as been outlined, uh, significantly more uh, Eastern European Jews return to Eastern Europe through the agency of, of, of the Board of Guardians rather than are deported under the Aliens Act between 1905 and 1914. But this action is combined with an assertion by groups such as the Board of Guardians that life in Stepney and Whitechapel was in every respect harder than life in America or even in back in Eastern Europe. To take another example, in the 1970s you have groups such as the West Indian Movement emerging from uh, uh, the peripheries of Caribbean uh, political formation in Britain uh, which stressed long-term unemployment police harassment and a failing education system as the fate for new Commonwealth migrants and their children growing up in Britain. And for groups such as the West Indian movement, 
the British state has effectively broken an informal contract formed in the late 1940s with the arrivals from the Caribbean islands. And because of this, should financially assist a mass movement uh, to the Caribbean. Now, in both of these cases, problematically, this discourse emanating from within sections of the minority community overlaps with that of anti-migrant organizations and to an extent is taken to legitimize the discourse of these latter groups. And the final strand that I'm going to talk about today is the existential. The idea that removal on a large scale is needed as an immediate response to some threat or challenge to British security or to British identity. This discourse often rejects legal niceties uh, and sometimes becomes completely detached from the status of those whose removal is being demanded. In other words, whether the targeted individual is born in the United Kingdom or not. Now, birthplace might seem to be absolutely fundamental to the language of repatriation and removal, but in fact, as we'll see, particularly in this existential strand, it can become a secondary concern and on some occasions it can become completely irrelevant. This strand can be the most dramatic, the most utopian, the most violent and is the hardest to actually transfer from the rhetorical to the actual. Um, as I already talked about, it's become indelibly associated with the far right, uh, but can on occasion emanate from the state, from the government, from the civil service, from organizations such as the Home Office, and indeed uh, on some occasions by forces that define themselves as politically progressive. Ex existential discourse, can demand exterminatory action, that through the threat of physical violence and through coercion, people will be forced out of the country in large numbers, and even to the degree that a form of ethnic cleansing will take place. And you often see in this existential discourse, particularly on the far right, and particularly in an anti-Semitic context, referrals to uh, precedent in the medieval and early modern periods uh, when communities were forced out wholesale um, with accompanying murder and appropriation of goods and particularly the expulsion of England's Jews in 1290 which fascist groups from the 1920s onwards um, make references to. In practice the three strands are almost always combined in discourse, but with different emphasis depending on context. The British state will stress the primacy of the practical strand, that it is carrying out a rational and coolly detached policy rooted in legality. It can adopt a pattern of humanitarianism as it carries out this policy, whilst appealing to existential concerns, either uh, explicitly or implicitly, it's known as dog whistle politics, um, as a vote winner because it's seen as politically popular. Progressive forces generally stress the humanitarian element, but as I've said, this can be combined often with practicality and sometimes with an existential discourse or elements of uh, tropes used in existential discourse. The most unvarnished form existential discourse emanates from the far right, as you might expect. But even here, beyond peripheral, even within uh, the peripheries, an openly violent, terroristic uh, uh, and homicidal groups, these organisations such as the British Union of Fascists in the 1930s on the National Front in the 70s and early 80s, will still make some appeal uh, to the practical and the humanitarian in their discourse. In a moment, I'll discuss some specific examples uh, of uh, particularly humanitarian existential discourse over the last two centuries. But first, for a bit of historical context, I'm going to outline three chronological periods uh, where a hostile environment, with a term being applied retrospectively, being enforced 
and where the three strands were combined. If we look at the traumatic period during and in the two decades after the Great Famine in Ireland, from the mid 1840s uh, up to the 1870s, the practical strand of repatriation discourse very much focused on the expenses incurred by that very much put upon section of Victorian society, the ratepayer, the property owning, tax paying middle classes in cities such as Liverpool and Glasgow, who it was felt took the burden for caring for the Irish destitute uh, uh, and also uh, uh, the uh, 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 strains placed on local, local infrastructure by the uh, mass exodus out of Ireland between 1845 and 51. The humanitarian strand in this discourse stressed the uh, abominable conditions apparent in these cities where Irish migrants were arriving in large numbers and that life would be in all respects better in America or even perhaps in Ireland, certainly after um, the famine comes to an end in the early 1850s. The existential, again, often voiced by these ratepayers as well as some Protestant clerics, um, really focuses on the Catholicism of the arrivals, their possible role as a papist vanguard um, and as part of some wider Catholic conspiracy, and also increasingly in the second half of the 19th century, ideas of racial inferiority and the conflation of Irish immigration with the growth of a proletarian underclass in British inner cities. Jumping forward 30 or 40 years during the movement out of the Pale of Settlement between 1881 and the First World War, um, the practical expressed in very similar terms focuses on the costs occasioned by Jewish migration and also uh, migrant criminality in various forms associated with the diasporic nature of, uh, uh, of the migrant Jewish community. The humanitarian aspect of this, um, which included proponents within the community, including no less, no less distinguished a figure than the chief rabbi Nathan Adler himself, stressed the fallacy of viewing London as a site of streets of gold, of somewhere where um, prosperity was, was, was achievable, um, and in fact stressed that Jewish migrants faced a future economic exploitation and indeed cultural dislocation and disconnection from religion and uh, culture. The existential discourse stressed rapid demographic change, the supplantation of Gentile communities and the establishment in East London of a so-called Jerusalem on Thames, as it was referred to in anti-migrant polemic or Jewtown in, in, in the cruder forms of anti-migrant rhetoric, as well as feeding into more general anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish control and supplantation. By the end of the first decade of the 20th century, by which point we have a permanent Aliens Act passed as legislation, these ideas have been expanded to encompass a threat, either from foreign Jews or from Jewry more generally, to intrinsic conceptions of what it meant to be British. And this is very much stressed by radical right organisations um, in the Edwardian period and in the years before the First World War. Moving on to the period of the breakdown of the post-Second World War consensus, broadly from uh, the rivers of blood speech up to the civil unrest of the early and mid 1980s. Again, we see some familiar themes in this discourse, a practical veneer stressing the cost of unemployment benefits, competition for council housing, demographic change in schools, et cetera, et cetera. Humanitarian conceptions of the reality of day-to-day -day life for people of Caribbean or South Asian nationality or descent in Britain, and existential fears of a sundering of the relationship between British identity and white skin colour, uh, as exempl exemplified in the, the, the slogan and the posters, uh, Keep Britain White, as well as certain moral panics at certain points on issues such as street crime. And you can see, um, looking at these three periods, the mid-19th century, the late 19th century and early 20th century, and the 1970s and 1980s, in some ways, um, 
the discourse is very similar in broad terms. In all three uh, junctures, we see a melding of concerns of expense, particularly what migration is costing the taxpayer, uh, an appreciation, perhaps a realistic appreciation that life in Britain is hard, perhaps intolerably hard for migrants and their descendants, and a sentiment that the migrant and minority community presents a serious threat to a certain core British identity defined in various ways, whether that identity is primarily defined as Protestant, Gentile or white. So that's a bit of historical context and an indication of these three strands as they're expressed um, in, as I've said, these three hostile environments preceding our own, which sort of begins in the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm now going to discuss some specific examples, first of humanitarian and then ex existential exterminatory removal uh, discourse. Now, discussion on removal and how this is going to work as practical policy rather than as utopian idea, we can define as a consistent background noise in modern Britain. But it really uh, forces its way into the discursive mainstream. Um, uh, particularly when legislation altering the legal treatment of migrants, uh, usually relating both to restriction of entry into the United Kingdom, but also the ability to remove people who have lived here, um, is being debated in the press and in Westminster. And these junctures tend to occur at times of uh, domestic or international crisis. So the 1793 Aliens Act uh, is an example of the latter in response to the events on the European continent in France and also in Ireland. The temporary legislation passed in 1848, which is very much based on fears of uh, foreigners supporting uh, homegrown subversives such as the Chartists, an example of the former. Removal of uh, Irish communities from Britain uh, who in, until 1922 were after all being harried from one part of the United Kingdom to another, also had to be legislated, but, but under poor amendments rather than alien bills, certainly up to the First World War. 1905, however, stands out really, um, really in comparison to either 1793 or, or 1848 as a point where migrant difference and where qualities which are considered undesirable by the British state become permanently codified in law. It also sets up an admittedly cumbersome apparatus for removing migrants who've committed certain defined transgressions from British territory. And the Aliens Act of 1905 forms the formation of uh, in certain respects, all legislation up to the 1940s um, affecting the treatment of migrant groups in Britain and the ability of the British state to both control their lives and ultimately to get rid of them if they should choose to do so. Notably, the Alien Restriction Act of 1914, subsequent legislation um, in 1919, um, and uh, uh, the Aliens Act is still being renewed and rewritten um, as late as the 1950s in codifying how migrants from outside of the former British Empire um, are treated in the United Kingdom. So the Aliens Act is the culmination of years of debate in both Houses of Parliament. The reports of special committees that carried out an exhaustive investigation into the evils of migration whose interviewees range from the Rothschilds to the founders of the British Brothers League, who we'll return to in a moment, and indeed making use of, and in some, in some respects, a response to an anti-Semitic discourse stretching back to beyond the 1880s. Now, the act, needless to say, is controversial. The Liberal Party has its own anti migrant elements, especially on the ground in areas of heavy Eastern European Jewish settlements, such as East London. But really, the Aliens Act, as it is passed through Parliament, 
is the baby of the Conservative Party. It's almost the last piece of legislation passed by the Tories before they lose the general election of 1906. Now, this is going to cause a bit of uh, difficulty because you have a Liberal administration who largely oppose the Act, enforcing it um, from 1906 to 1914. But in the run-up, generally the Liberals are opposed. That wing of the party who might be expected to support restriction and expulsion had been effectively shorn off following the departure of the so-called Liberal Unionists, led by Austin Chamberlain, uh, in 1905, over the particular issue of Irish Home Rule, which we not really time to go into now. That's a whole different um, lecture. Um, so the proposed act is widely viewed in progressive circles as a reactionary move and emanating from the most chauvinistic and jingoistic elements of the Conservative Party. Um, and it's after all out of this Tory milieu that you get the British Brothers League emerging in 1901, although it frames itself as a cross-party organisation, and the Workers' Defence Union um, which has its genesis in South London emerging in 1906-1907, which are really the first identifiably proto-fascist organisations to emerge in this country, and which propound a very radical, to an extent anti-establishment, viscerally racist street politics, which is uh, qualitatively different from the patrician uh, xenophobia and anti-Semitism traditionally associated with the Conservative Party. Many leading Liberals recoil instinctively from these elements uh, uh, and the Act is viewed in Liberal circles both as an affront to the tradition of hospitality and also the principle of the free movement of peoples in both a political and economic sense. The Labour Party, which is just starting to spread its wings at this point, also opposes the Act in Parliament. It's viewed as an attempt to set worker against worker and one that would target the poorest class of migrant, the so-called steerage class travellers. But not all Liberals oppose the Alien Act in principle. And for some, repatriation has the potential to serve as a far kinder and more tolerant form of control on migration than the bill actually being proposed by the Conservatives. In a debate, one of many in the House of Commons in May 1905, Herbert Samuel, one of the most prominent Jewish MPs in the Liberal Party and indeed in Parliament, discusses how a progressive form of repatriation policy could function. And he says this, there is no machinery yet invented which can reveal a man's character and capacity it is absolutely impossible to say whether a man who comes here with nothing in his pocket is not destined to rise to quite distinguished heights. Even if you do detect at the eight port your 31 undesirables among the thousand immigrants and send them back, what will happen? If they wish to come to the country, they will inevitably embark on a cattle boat or some other ship going to some other port. The right policy with regard to undesirable aliens is the policy of expulsion. So far, this bill will undoubtedly do good. And if the government would propose the expulsion clauses alone, I think we would all give the bill our benediction and use our best efforts to secure its passage. So in other words, what Samuel is saying is that expulsion, if based on a set and reasonable would merit it would be more humane and would be more discerning than simply turning everyone away at Dover or Southampton. It would weed out the bad migrants, so defined, the undesirable, the criminal, while allowing others to achieve all they could in Britain, even allowing this country, possibly, to become something approximating the United States, the golden Medina, the golden land in Yiddish, where migrants can truly ascend the socio-economic ladder. As a bit of background, the various stances adopted by Anglo-Jewish uh, politicians on the Aliens Act, as you can imagine, are enormously controversial within the wider community. In certain respects, Samuel's position overlaps with the Board of Guardians, which I've already outlined, that those migrants who in their assessment can contribute to British society should be helped to do so, and those who can't, who could not or would not, should return to Eastern Europe. 
And certainly in the board's attitude, if not Samuel's, there are underlying elements of social Darwinism here in that assessment of who makes a positive contribution and who doesn't. So that's a brief outline of what we can call humanitarian policy on repatriation. Samuel is challenged on this in Parliament, including by one of his main opponents, the Conservative MP, William Evans Gordon, uh, honourable member for Stepney, and one of the leading lights of the British Brothers League. Evans Gordon, as you might expect, really leads the charge for his draconian draconian and comprehensive an Aliens Act as possible. And he has his own ideas on what constitutes a humanitarian position on removal. In 1903, Evans Gordon publishes a short book entitled The Alien Immigrant, which is actually based on his own travels to Eastern Europe. In it, Evans Gordon makes the case um, against the idea that Jews, as compared to other minorities, are suffering excessive or unusual persecution in Russia and Romania, and even makes the extraordinary suggestion that a return to these lands would be relatively unproblematic. However, uh, Evans Gordon ultimately concludes that it would be much fairer to the Jewish refugee to be barred from entering Britain in the first place, in the first case, and instead obliged to travel somewhere else rather than settle put down roots uh, and then be forced out at some future unspecified time. And what Evans Gordon posits is that all the money which would be spent implementing this aspect of the Aliens Act, expulsion, would be better used improving conditions for Jews in Eastern Europe, although it doesn't really indicate how that would practically work. This language, this discourse, becomes more rather than less extreme after the Aliens Act is passed. Um, as you might expect, for a bill which in some respects grows out of these utopian conceptions of removal, uh, there's a huge amount of disappointment after 1905. There's a feeling among some of its primary exponents that the Act has been compromised. There's suspicion about the Liberals actually enacting the Act. Um, uh, the rhetoric of groups such as the BBL, the Workers' Defence Union, elements, the diehard elements of the Conservative Party actually ramps up um, rather than subsides after 1905 up to 1914. And we'll discuss that in a bit. Um, uh, and to an extent, the Liberal Party and the Liberal government, which is actually enforcing the Act, also adopts some of these tropes about the migrant as criminal and the migrant as an existential threat as they, as they attempt to enforce um, these provisions. Humanitarian concerns in this discourse continue to be stressed over the 20th century. Now, sometimes this is relatively uncontroversial, as with the return of Belgian refugees at the end of the First World War in 1918, 1919, which is very much framed in the language of, you know, rebuilding your country after the German occupation as a patriotic duty, is also assisted by subsidised train and boat fares. Sometimes it's enormously controversial. Um, as is the case with the Basque children refugees who arrived in Britain in the first year of the Spanish Civil War in 1936-37. Uh, largely forgotten today in the histories of migration. The offering of Britain as a refuge to the Basques is uh, popular in the prevalent anti-fascist mood of the time, although the British government in 1936 and 1937 makes clear that this is going to have to be funded almost entirely by private charities. Uh, so this is initially popular, but however, very soon this, um, what we could call a uh, pattern of humanitarianism emerges, asking for the Basque children to be returned, especially after Franco uh, conquers the Basque country. And this is expounded not only by the explicitly fascist press, journals such as the Black Shirt and Action, but also by elements of the Conservative Party, that the war is no longer being fought in this region, that these children have been separated from their parents and that they need uh, to return, that this would be the kindest thing to do. At the same time, these elements, particularly the fascist press, are having their cake and eating it. They're also stressing that the Basque children are both uh, delinquents causing uh, trouble and are communist agents as well. It's an example of this discourse as wholly disingenuous, but it's also successful. 
a large majority of the Basque children are returned and many of them, rather than being reunited with their parents, are placed in Francoist or church-run orphanages. During periods defined by the existence of a hostile environment, um, this humanitarian pattern can be adopted by those enforcing removal, i.e. the state. And a relatively recent example of this is the notorious Operation Vacant, um, enacted by the coalition government in 2013, which to be fair, does seem a very long time ago now. Uh, and this campaign, which only really um, doesn't emerge beyond its trial run in six London boroughs, becomes known for this message, go home or face arrest, which is plastered on lorries in the areas as well as on leaflets distributed. As you may remember, the campaign uh, attracts a barrage of criticism. Its language is described as redolent of that in the National Front used in the 1970s, particularly in these areas of London where Operation Vacant is trialed, it has to be said. It's also seen as ineffective and it's quietly dropped. Um, and this is uh, a, a clear example, really, of a combination of the practical and the existential, but very much the case is made by the Home Office that this is humanitarian in intent, that. Uh, uh, it would make life easier for the people being targeted, the so-called illegal immigrant, for them to leave voluntarily with the assistance of the state rather than go through the unpleasant experience of being arrested and forcibly deported. So these elements meld together. And those are just some different examples of how humanitarian discourse has been employed, whether genuinely or uh, disingenuously. So moving on, the final part of this paper to look at uh, this discourse in existential terms. Now, existential discourse is not necessarily exterminatory, but it is a crucial step towards formulating a policy that calls for expulsion on mass. And it has some characteristics which separate it from these other forms of rhetoric. Crucially, both the practical and the humanitarian strands of removal discourse focus on the agency of the individual. It's about one particular um, person who, for whatever reason, has failed to find work in Britain or has committed a transgression in some way, and, and they will be dealt with by this legislation or focused on in these ideas. Whereas the existential, to a far greater degree, looks at the corporate identity of different groups in a society um, who are presented as being antipathetical um, towards each other with the idea that one group or the other will triumph over the other and to prevent this one group has to be um, removed and as I'll discuss in just a moment it can involve the rhetorical dehumanization of the targeted group. As I say existential discourse does not necessarily lead to exterminatory ideas and language but it is a crucial first step. In the 20th century, it's most apparent, firstly, in, well, really the situation between 1914 and 1918, and then in fascist polemic expressed by different organisations from the 1920s onwards, but it's present from the mid-19th century, and it's there in attitudes towards the Irish at that time. To take some brief quotes from a London-based newspaper, The Era, from March 1851, which was entitled The Irish Pauper Nuisance, um, Irish immigrants in the article are described as being stowed like pigs and in no better condition than swine in their journey to Britain across the Irish Sea. Uh, they're compared with the locusts that afflicted Egypt in the Book of Exodus. Um, so already you're seeing the animalization, the dehumanization of migrants, and this particular correspondent ends by demanding a proactive policy of removal by the British authorities of, of, of the poorest class of Irish migrant. And this rhetoric continues and develops over the 19th century and into the 20th. In the 19th century, refugees both from Eastern Europe and migrants of Ireland are historically associated with various illnesses, especially typhoid fever, cholera and tuberculosis. And what you see happening in the last decade of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th 
is this rhetorical shift from identifying the migrant as a carrier of disease to the migrant, particularly the Jewish migrant, as constituting a form of disease or infection themselves. You look at this rhetoric and medical terminology is used all the time. And this is adopted by those radical right organisations I've already um, mentioned, the BBL, the WDU and others. Some of this polemic comes very close to an incitement towards communal violence. So this is an article in a Workers' Defence Union publication from 1910. It ends with the statement that one day the English people will fumigate their household and the continental jails will be richer by a few thousand welcome prodigals. So this isn't only just demanding large scale removal of migrants seen as a threat. It's borderline exterminatory. Sometimes that borderline is crossed. This is a poem published in a journal called The People in 1909. It concludes with the line, I would give them one chance, just one week to clear out, and if found in the land were an hour later, then death without trial or falling about, whether anarchist, banker or waiter. And here you can see the use of anti-Jewish tropes, the Jewish uh, migrant as political subversive, the Jew as capitalist, and also an indication of a growing anti-German sentiment in this country. Um, German waiters were viewed as a, a sort of a, a particular source of potential espionage and a, what would be called a fifth column against the British state. And this is a clear antecedent of fascist literature in the end of the war period. Dehumanisation, animalisation of migrants continues into the post-consensus era. Black people in particular are simianised in far-right literature. One notorious fascist pamphlet from the mid-1970s, which is subsequently republished in anti-fascist material, contains an image of a gorilla above the words independence for Brixton. The NF journal National Front News even recycled sketches taken from late 19th century racial science publications, which compared the cranial capacity of an African with that of an orangutan. Removal discourse in the neo-fascist press also made much of uh, new Commonwealth migrants and those of new Commonwealth heritage being removed to tropical wildernesses in other parts of the world. As an example, after the civil unrest in St. Paul's in Bristol in 1980, the NF, in one of their publications, described the area as a jungle region ruled by savages, which was followed by an, a demand for immediate compulsory repatriation of all so-called coloured migrants, a term when which used by the NF and also by other anti-migrant forces, uh, becomes completely detached, really, from the idea of birthplace and is used to refer to all people of Caribbean, African or South Asian heritage, regardless of birthplace. Yet even in the discourse of the far right, rooted as it is in this utopian and existential conception of zero-sum struggle, uh, uh, the language of humanitarianism can be used. And I'm going to indicate here some examples from the 1930s and 1970s where these strands are combined. The idea that Jews, regardless of birthplace, would at some stage be removed en masse from Britain has its roots really in before the First World War. Uh, um, it becomes more apparent from 1917, 1918, and it really reaches its apogee when articulated by anti-Semites such as Henry Hamilton Beamish of the Britons and Arnold Lease of the Imperial Fascist League from the 1920s onwards. And Lease and Beamish articulate this scheme of forced expulsion of all Jews to Madagascar. En masse, regardless of birthplace, financed by the appropriation of Jewish goods and property and enforced by a, a league of Nordic navies which will patrol the Madagascan coast. This would include groups that uh, least refer to in this polemic as half-castes, i.e. Um, non-Jews of Jewish heritage, and he continues to make this, uh, 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 to express these ideas up to his death in 1956 and release this discourse is very openly exterminatory. 
In the 1930s and 40s, however, in the period dominated by Oswald Mosley, first by the British Union of Fascists and then later by the Union Movement after 1948, these ideas of removal, while still fundamentally predicated on the assumption that they'll be enforced by violence, start to adopt humanitarian elements and particularly start to use this language of self-determination that the removal of all Jews from Britain would be tied to the creation of a Jewish territory, a Jewish national territory in some other part of the globe, although it was a matter of debate um, within the BUA. This would be the least for some other world. In 1936, Robert Gordon Canning of the BUF, very much in the public eye, wrote that in a pamphlet. The British Union is not antagonistic to the creation of a Jewish state only not in Palestine, and do its utmost towards the attainment of that ideal. The way of national socialism is neither to shirk responsibility, nor to imagine a palliative is a cure, and thus leave a disease more deeply rooted than ever for its children to solve, or more probably, from which to perish. And you can see here that Gordon Canning is really combining this sort of humanitarian discourse of self-determination with these existential ideas that if Jews are not removed, there'll be some sort of final battle between Gentiles and Jews in Britain, which the BUF is acting to prevent and mitigate. Two years later, in Mosley's second fascist manifesto, Tomorrow We Live, the so-called leader with a capital L expanded upon these ideas. He said, it is not in accord with the British character to keep Jews here in order to bully them. That we will never do. On the contrary, the statesmanship of the future, i.e. Mosley's statesmanship, must find a solution of this question on the lines of the Jews again becoming an integral nation. So in other words, the existential threat of a Jewish presence in Britain will be solved by humanitarian means, the creation of a new Jewish nation overseas. And in other uh, publications, most of these lieutenants make clear that uh, for any Jews who remain in Britain, uh, uh, their fate will be um, uh, uh, complete removal of nationality, voting rights, economic status, etc, etc. Now we jump forward uh, 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 a generation or so to that uh, fascist discourse of the early 1970s. The National Front grows out of smaller, explicitly national socialist groups operating since the late 1950s, all of which, um, again, go back to Arnold Lees, demand repatriation implicitly achieved through physical violence. Groups like the British Movement, led by Colin Jordan, which continues to be avowedly Nazi in policy, uh, uh, keep on using uh, demands for explicitly violent terroristic action to achieve this. However, in the NF publication Spearhead in 1971, slightly more complex ideas are advanced. The then F leader John O'Brien wrote in Spearhead in 1971, he says in, in part of a lengthy article, it is immediately clear that we cannot simply push surplus aliens into the sea nor in equity should we seek to return them to the identical condition of poverty and lack of opportunity whence they came. We cannot do these things because we are a Christian country and because a National Front government would be a responsible government. So these ideas would be developed by the NF and ideological successors um, uh, into the 1970s and 1980s. Now, why is this important? So I'll just bring things to an end as I realise my hour is almost up. Um, existential discourse uh, has consequences outside of the rhetorical sphere. Uh, 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 even when advanced by these peripheral uh, organisations, for one thing, uh, 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 sometimes the far right discourse can influence the debate in the mainstream. Uh, 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 sometimes government policy, such as uh, ideas in the 1930s of relocation of German Jews to Tanganyika, or indeed ideas of the relocation of Ugandan Asian refugees in 1972 to the Falklands, which is briefly posited, um, and not that far removed 
from the ideas of the far right, and also that this is accompanied by physical violence in 1915, 1919, Notting Hill in 1958, or indeed across Britain in the 1970s. As I've discussed, these ideas have a disturbing potency, and they retain these potent, this potency to the present day, as evidenced by the current Home Office policy. Um, uh, on the removal of all migrants crossing the channel to Rouen, which we'll perhaps we'll have a chance to discuss. As I've said, these strands of discourse become combined, and often there is an element of knowing deception. Uh, existential discourse is given a humanitarian veneer, and official policies that present themselves as the practical, detached from the emotions that such ideas stir up, appeal on one some level to this idea of existential confrontation and expulsion as the answer to these issues. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was really uh, thorough and covered uh, a lot of ground and sort of a deconstructed world repatriation uh, discourse in Britain over the last two centuries. So. Um, can I open it up to questions from the audience either? Um, you can, um, okay, so we've got uh, one question from Telly Amaludum. Do you want to, um, would you like to go ahead? Um, yeah, yes, firstly, uh, I'd like to congratulate you, Daniel, uh, for your presentation. Um, it's kind of um, reminded me of the work I've done and the various categorization uh, you presented. For example, for example, the fantasy about race, which is about um, who we are and uh, the other. And also, um, you use the existential threat. I termed it paranoid anxiety, which is mm -hmm. very common uh, mm -hmm. and particularly when the paranoid anxiety has been generated um, uh, at, at, you know, over the, over the period, I've, I've been really interested in, it would be interesting to do some research on the kind of dreams migrants have when, you know, this paranoid anxiety of, the, you know, the threat to, uh, to, to the nation. Um, and also, it, it's linked to, by the way, to um, Margaret Mead's dirt, you know, uh, which is matter out of place. This is a, because of my own mm. analysis about being contaminated, you know, mm. the disease that uh, uh, they bring um, and the danger to the body, to the body. Um, you might be interested um, in um, reading um, Roger Monical's uh, paper in 1941 on this uh, psychology of propaganda. You probably are aware of it. If you haven't, I will, I will recommend it because it was about um, when he was in Germany, the way uh, the, uh, the Nazis tried to generate the paranoid anxiety, you know, uh, the, uh, and, 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 you know, firstly, they tell you the situation is bad uh, and you know it it uh, the, uh, the depresses the uh, 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 the audience making them feel bad and, mm. and then uh, it's the Jews you know it's this is that uh, uh, pointing mm. at the the threat and then the solution we are the solution you know uh, uh, so I don't know if you're aware of that the other point no, um, is, is um, uh, the work of uh, David Livingston Smith, who was uh, actually uh, my tutor and um, uh, supervisor uh, for my PhD. Uh, well, no, not my, uh, it was my tutor for, uh, when I did my MA and tried to analyze this issue, this area. Um, and he's, um, he's come up with some interesting uh, um, uh, uh, books on dehumanization. I could recommend you Making Monsters, The Uncanny Power of Dehumanization and on Inhumanities. So uh, the, 
the um, uh, is is uh, is his latest work. So yes, great job. Mm. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, you, and you see all the time, um, particularly as you said, with anti-Semitic discourse, the idea of the, the Jew literally is this sort of contagion, this alien element in the body, um, which needs to be removed um, for, the, for the health of the wider organism. Um, even in, in some respects preceding fascism, um, you get these, these debates in the 1890s which begin by talking about illnesses being brought over from the East, um, such as cholera. Um, and they begin with this sort of medical analysis and, and, and diagnosis, and then expand into an anti-migrant um, polemic. Um, as we were saying, you know, you move from the, the Jew in particular, and indeed people from further East who Jewish migration is seen as the sort of the vanguard of as spreading illness to them being an illness themselves. And then absolutely, when you get and talk about Nazi propaganda, when you get to people like Arnold Lease, who very much views himself as having a natural affinity with Stryker and to Sturmer in, in Nazi Germany, that becomes explicit. And you see it in black shirt cartoons of, of Jews literally presented as a contagion. As, the only thing I, also, I, I want to add more recently is, is the collusion bit. In t uh, just before the uh, last general election, how mm. uh, uh, and General Comey was demonized. And if you recall, there was a lot of uh, anxiety about uh, whether uh, UK was safe, you know, for the Jewish community, uh, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, um, even Labour, uh, um, uh, MPs and uh, the chief rabbi, uh, uh, you know, were helping to generate this. What I actually see is anti-Semitic, but fear of, uh, uh, um, uh, for, uh, for uh, 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 you know, uh, for the Jewish community, and having uh, with Netanyahu saying, uh, you know, to the Jewish community, you know, come to Israel, you'll be safe there. You know, so it's a safe. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Corbyn uh, you know, was the threat now, but essentially mm -hmm. uh, it's this kind of a, a, a collusion uh, you've highlighted throughout, the, uh, you, you know, history that those who mm -hmm. would collude to generate fears uh, uh, against uh, um, uh, in a particular community uh, for a political end. But, but, but which also indicates that, you know, even, <laughs> even, you know, sort of, 100 years on from the beginning of the sort of rhetoric we've been talking about, the idea that some sort of expulsion of Jews could take place conceivably, that that could be made yes. use of. Um, yeah. And um, I mean, going back to Brexit, which I sort of started with and not wanting to, to labour that point too much, but something that really struck me when looking at the material on people being told to leave in the days following the vote included um, Jewish people being told to go to Israel. Um, so, 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 but, but the idea that that sort of conceivably could take place, however you use the idea. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay, I think, thank you very much. I think we've got a question from Neha. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I, no, I we can't hear you. I don't know if you, you've got a... You could always type the answer. If you want to type your question. Okay. Uh, maybe in, in the meantime, I'll ask a question. Um, I, 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 want, <laughs> I, I wondered why you chose the word repatriation rather than uh, any other word because um, that's I mean I guess that's quite a, a euphemism for really bad stuff I mean I know in your in your I mean in your book you use repatriation in your lecture you used repatriation removal hmm. yes um 
so it's it, it's repatriation as it's used in discourse which as i sort of I, I, I did mention becomes detached from the specific term of being removed to your country of origin and implicitly the country um, uh, that you were born in and certainly in in far right uh, discourse uh, 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 becomes a, a, a shorthand for general removal of people viewed as being outside the collectivity um, but but you are right and the cost I mean they they are they are different terms if you, if you, you know for, for for exact meaning and what they imply yes um, but it is a term I mean there's a, a, a um, what's it called it's the David Edgar play destiny um, from the late 1970s where you have uh, the the sort of what they call national action, um, the sort of the National Front standing group, where the leader who's being prepped before an interview says, "Oh, there's going to be repatriation, humane repatriation, and also repatriation of the immigrants born here." Um, and 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 then the other people, how do you how how do you get that remote control? And uh, uh, and that that notorious line from the 1970s is brought out there. A cat born in a kipper box isn't a, a kipper. Um, so, I mean, the so repatriation, I think, is used in discourse, gets detached from that specific meaning of a, a relationship based on birth in one particular place and takes on these much wider connotations of um, uh, uh, removal. Uh, it's possibly to a land of, 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 of your parent or grandparents origin um, in the National Front Guyana scheme um, just a, a, a country in, 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 in the general region where some of the, the migrants and their descendants were, were, were coming from um, yeah there is a there is a, a, a definitely a, a difference between the two terms in the correct use of, 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 of the Okay, um, so do you, can you read the, the, the question about the... So Niha, um, so Clause 9 of the Nationality and Borders Bill, um, you're going to have to explain it for me first. Okay, um, and this is, I mean, is that that's particularly in the context of people going over to to, to Syria, I assume, and then whether they um, return, if it can be claimed they hold citizenship of another country. Um, what do I make of it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a, a, a demonstration of the continuing use um, of uh, this discourse, um, an idea of, of 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 people holding a primary loyalty, and that uh, uh, being related to the status and citizenship. Um, but 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 yeah, the the the, the I don't know the legalistic no man's land that people can find um themselves in i mean if you sort of relate it back to say people who went over to fight in spain um in, in the 1930s who faced prosecution on their return um under i think quite uh, 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 archaic legislation um but 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 this is obviously qualitatively different um uh, 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 and yeah i mean it's, it's part of of the current hostile environment but also an idea that citizenship isn't something intrinsic and inherent but it's something that can be bestowed um and taken away uh as well uh any more questions <clears throat> 
Uh, okay, maybe I'll ask a couple. Um, so, I, I mean, you use the phrase hostile environment in, actually, I've probably got three questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you ask that, you use the phrase hostile environment in a, I remember when that phrase first came up, mm. um, it just struck me. Well, what occurred to me, so the question I want to ask, is there any period when Britain isn't a hostile environment? I mean, I know you used it in, specific, in a specific way, but is there any period in the last, in your, you know, in the last two centuries since the 1840s when Britain hasn't been a hostile environment um, for, for migrants? And then the second um, question was about, um, I mean, I know you do this in your book, but I wonder if you can, I mean, the two periods when uh, deportation really takes place on masses is World War I, well, especially World War I, um, and then to some extent around World War II. And then, yeah. sorry, finally, um, well, what about Rwanda, these, these ideas about Rwanda? Hmm. So, I mean, I guess I'm just, it's, it's the continuity stuff, really. Which is what you're paying so, so has there ever been a period where there wasn't a hostile environment <laughs> <laughs> maybe with the Huguenots for a bit um in the in the early modern period i don't i don't know um no there was that that there was tons of hostility towards <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah frog landers etc um I, I guess it's whether we define hostile environment as a period where there are groups trying to make political capital out of anti-migrant sentiment or a more general hostility towards a minority group and the state actively and uh you know draconian in a draconian manner um making it difficult for people to enter the country and easy for people to be um removed so i guess i guess it's 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 whether you use the first or second of those definitions and i mean so for example you know was 1881 to say 1905 a hostile environment in terms of what the british government was doing in terms of jewish immigration well not really the legislation wasn't there to remove large numbers of Jewish refugees could we define it as a period where Jewish immigrants felt they were welcomed even by the host society or indeed by other elements of Anglo Jewry um I don't think so you know I don't I don't think it could be defined as that I think there was an anti-semitic sentiment throughout that period um and I guess again 1948 to 1962 you know the, the period between the british nationality act and the commonwealth immigrants act the, the same thing i mean the, the state wasn't actively um facilitating the removal of large numbers of people from the caribbean and south asia but anyone who lived through notting hill and notting gate in 1958 he said to them are you living in a hostile environment or not <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So I think it's it's which of those two definitions you take. I mean, I think if you take the first definition, yes, it's it's sporadic. But I mean, we've legislatively we've been in one since what 1999 to the current point. If you take it as a general sentiment, it ebbs and flows, and come on to your next question, reaches possibly its most extreme point in 1914 to 1916, but. But, but yeah, it's it's there most of the time, if not the whole of the time. I think, oh, I can't. Sorry, what, what about the Rwanda? Because you, you, <laughs> you mentioned it in your, on your lecture about possibly discussing it. In the... Yeah, well, this, this happened halfway through me writing the paper. It's, I mean, as I'm sure we're all aware of the problem with during the history of migration is you're continually having to update your contemporary references which supplant each other um 
the Rwanda question, I mean, how much can I say about it? It's part of a long tradition. Um, I mean, this, that, that goes back to ideas articulated in the 1890s. I mean, simultaneously to the emergence of Zionism, you have anti-migrant groups making use of this discourse to the idea that all Jews or certainly all foreign Jews should find a national state and then they were talking about possibly Uganda, mm. possibly Argentina um, and then as I said you know the, the Chamberlain in 1939 saying maybe East German sorry German refugees from Nazi Germany would be sent to Tanganyika mm. to some part of sub-Saharan Africa, mm. various schemes in the 1970s for where refugees would be sent and the government brought it up six months ago with in relation to Ghana until the Ghanese government, Ghanaian government said they hadn't been told of the fact. So I mean I think this is part of a long continuity. Uh, I just think whether it will be enacted or not, or whether ultimately it will be abandoned very quickly on, as indeed it was by I think Australia and Israel who who thought of similar schemes in Denmark at the moment. I mean it's you know it's so, I mean, let's be honest here. It's about headlines, I think. Maybe um, the government, maybe the government will decide exactly there's enough of it, so we don't want to implement it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but but yeah, it's part of a long continuity. I think. Yeah. It, it will. I think it will be significant if they actually enact it and yeah. continue with this policy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it might be a. Uh, uh, a precursor to even more draconian and unpleasant action, possibly, yeah. I think. Yeah. But we'll have to see. Okay. We'll see we'll continue with the we've policy. got. So we will take two final um, questions. One, one's in in the chat, and um, I think we've got. Um, let's. Uh, Tele was first, so we'll, we'll 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 take his question first. Yes, it, it's really to, to reiterate the uh, and see a kind of a contrast. Uh, the uh, 1948 in which uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, they encouraged migration from the West Indies, but uh, it was essentially uh, temporary, and the Muslim, you know, the, there was the fear of uh, uh, of uh, black men, you know, intermarrying uh, uh, white women. Whereas, in, in contrast, there was the European. Uh, volunteer workers who were encouraged, they were okay because they're white, uh, and uh, uh, to not link it to what is happening in the Ukraine uh, um, mm. now, uh, uh, that suddenly, yet yeah, Ukrainians are welcome, but yet uh, those who are of a, a darker skin, uh, um, you know, they're going to be deported to Africa. So there is the colonial legacy uh, 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 that, that is uh, being played there. And if, if, even uh, the uh, or welcoming the Ukrainian, it's 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 really another propaganda of um, of. Um, but it's, it's it's a kind of I use the word ambivalence. You know, there's a certain ambivalence. Mm -hmm. uh, this type is okay because you are white, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we will open uh, you know people to volunteer to take them in. But yet, look what's happened in Yemen uh, and uh, the, the destruction that was created uh, uh, in the Middle East and, and in Africa. That, that uh, but yet they're seen as they're seen as the threats. You know, the dirt. Uh, that's going to, uh, you know, the paranoid. Where I say, okay, oh, this. I mean, you, you, I mean, you saw it. You know, even the the, the, the Ukrainian, the racism, uh, the black uh, uh, African uh, uh, people experience uh, uh, in Ukraine, and and um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the journalists saying that oh, this are you know blonde, blue eye uh, uh, people, you know, it's not, it's as if, you know, you've got to save this lot of people because they're not like uh, uh, you know. You know uh, uh, the parkies. Uh, that is essentially the the. We've got to understand the nature of historical racism and I, uh, how it plays up, as you said, I, at uh, in time of crisis. Then that is when it comes very either economic crisis or, uh, as you said, during conflict. You you 
you get to see the real underbelly of 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 uh, uh, the society. I mean, I think there are two separate but but interconnected points here. First of all, I think, and, and as I said, I think that there's there's a connection between them. I think first of all, there's the idea of the good migrant and the bad migrant, which stretches back a long time. And as you say, Tully, is in, in certainly in the post Second World War period becomes predicated on skin colour. Absolutely, with the labour shortage after the Second World War, very much this idea that, that people from Eastern Europe, even ex enemies, Italian and German POWs, are more welcome here than um, people coming from particularly the Caribbean. But it, but I mean, but you can take it back beyond that, and and, and again, talking about anti Semitism in the late 19th, early 20th century, you look at anti migrant literature from that period, and very much this talk about, well, you have the migrants from, and again, in the United States as well, you have the migrants from Northern Europe, from Scandinavia, from the Low Countries, even possibly from Germany, as compared uh, favorably to say people coming from, Jews coming from Eastern Europe or uh, Italians. Um, so, so, but there's that long, that long contrast, the good migrant who contributes and the bad migrant who has to be prevented from entering or, or forced to leave. Um, and, and, and but the second point, and I think this is what's apparent in Ukraine, is the idea of incongruity and what's been formed in the period, as I said, of this present hostile environment, which is coined, I can't remember if it's the end of the 90s, but the beginning of the 2000s, but certainly, you know, just the, the sort of the cusp of the 21st century itself, which grows out of this sustained press campaign against what are referred to as bogus asylum seekers, which is really, I can remember, that's the first time I'd have been about 10 or 11 when that started. And the first time I really became aware of the fact that the that newspapers and would, would have an agenda and press that agenda. And there's that sustained period of press hostility towards what we termed as bogus asylum seekers before the implementation of the hostile environment. But what I think has happened over that period is there has become an assumption, as you say, that refugees are people, well, largely from either sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East or Asia. And that's where refugees come from. And there's the incongruity of refugees coming from a European country. And certainly there is an element of racist discourse in that. Um, yeah, but, but, but I think the, the narrative of the good refugee and the bad refugee can go beyond skin colour. I mean, I think as was evidenced by the relatively brief positive response of newspapers like the Daily Mail, like the Daily Express, to the failure to get people who had worked with the British authorities in Afghanistan successfully out of the country a few months ago. Um, but there, I mean, there definitely is an element of, of, of skin colour based racism in that dichotomy, but it can go beyond that, I would say, as well. Okay, shall we take this final question in, in the chat and then we'll have to wrap up. Okay, so the, 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 the idea of repatriation and conceptions of nation and nationhood. Um, so, I mean, you get these various laws passed, usually the edict of a monarch before the early modern period. And while the idea of the nation state is forming, that arbitrarily expel people from the country. And you certainly have an idea of national minorities in medieval England. I mean, the expulsion of 1290, it can't be referred to as repatriation really. And it's got a religious uh, context to it. It's the expulsion of Jews in 1290 from England. People have written though, how it is actually seen as a step towards the creation of an English nationality, which will form in the next two or three hundred years. Um, I mean, I guess it could be argued, these expulsions, they're not just dependent on nationality, they play a part in forming ideas of nationality, not just the difference of Jews, but say the difference of Gascons or Flemish traders or, or Walloonians. 
or Scots. I mean, the Scots are, are expelled from England on a couple of occasions in the Tudor period. So it's sort of tied in with it. It precedes it to an extent. What I'd say, though, I mean, going back to what Panikos said about repatriation or removal and the use of the two terms, these are expulsions. They're no attempt to say you have to return to this country or this is the place we intend you to go to. You know, the expulsion of 1290 and a lot of these subsequent expulsions, they are they are predicated on you get out or you will be killed and we're not really bothered where you go to. Um, but I think that is an interesting question. I think it evolves alongside the idea of nationhood, which after all emerges through oppositions, external oppositions, suddenly you're English rather than French or Spanish, um, but also your English is compared to other people within the community um, and increasingly people who don't have the same rights that you will have as someone born in, uh, in this country. Which again goes back to the previous question about uh, uh, people having their citizenship removed for terroristic activity. The idea that is your citizenship inherent intrinsic or is it arbitrary? And if it is inherent intrinsic, what makes it that? Is it uh, where you were born or is it your religion or is it your skin colour or is it a combination of, um, of those things? Okay, thank you very much again for your paper and for answering those um, questions really uh, rigorously. So um, that's the um, final session of the year um, and we're hoping to continue this next year, but we haven't worked out um, how to, uh, how we're going to do it. So more to follow. So thanks again um, to Dan um, for a very uh, rigorous um, talk. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Really good to see you. Bye. Okay, bye.